Amen. All right, well, I want to thank, of course, all of you for being here tonight. This is a really uh, great crowd here uh, tonight, and uh, I appreciate you being here with us. And, uh, of course, I want to just take a moment and uh, say thank you to Pastor Burzins and uh, Miss, Miss Leslie uh, for all of the hospitality and the accommodations. Everything's just been perfect. All of the snacks and the food and everything's been amazing, the gifts. Uh, we were given a wall art that I'm going to take home and tell my wife that I picked up for her. No, I'm just kidding. And uh, so I found this uh, at the airport for you. No, it's, it's great. And I, I just really appreciate, really appreciate everything. Everything is beautiful. This is the kind of camping trip I like. I like the camping trip where you show up and they serve you a steak dinner. Those are nice. So um, that's, that's great. The dinner was great tonight. Everything was great. And I uh, just really appreciate everybody uh, being here. I'm really excited that we're going to be having Pastor Burzins back with us at the Red Hot Preaching Conference this year. Uh, so I'm looking forward to him being there. And of course, I want to invite you to come to the Red Hot Preaching Conference. If you haven't been, uh, we'd love to show you uh, how uh, California is. If you haven't been in California, you can come out and visit for the conference. That would be uh, great. And again, I just want to say thank you for all the hospitality. I've got uh, my two sons with me and my daughter, my three oldest kids, Joshua, Joel, and Elizabeth, and they're having a great time. And uh, again, just thank you very much, everybody, for being here and for all of the uh, hospitality. And uh, someone said, years and years and years ago, somebody told me that uh, preachers have the tendency to preach the way they look. They preach the way they look. So I don't know if that's true. But if that's true, then tonight's sermon's probably going to be short and ugly. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just get right, right into it. You're there in Revelation chapter number 4. Revelation chapter 4, if there's any way, if I could ask somebody, if I could just get a bottle of water, I would really appreciate that. If anybody could help me with that. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. And I'll just set this down here. Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, we have a passage of Scripture that is uh, kind of a unique it's a, it's a unique chapter. You'll notice it's only 11 verses, the chapter, and it's what we would call a transitional chapter in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 4, there's not really anything that's going on except for the fact that, of course, John is on the Isle of Patmos, and he's been caught up in the Spirit. He's going to be given a vision of, of course, the end times and the events that will happen in the end times. And in chapter 4, what we simply get is a description of the throne room of God. God. Notice there in verse 1, the Bible says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Again, this is uh, John getting a view of, uh, of, of the throne of God. It says that a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And if we have any preach rivers here tonight, no, that's not the rapture. Uh, verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. I want you to notice that John is seeing this vision and he's giving us this description of the vision of the throne of God. Notice how he describes it, verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So the Bible is describing for us this view of God. We're told that there's a throne, and he that sat on the throne, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. To look at him is to look at this, it's, it's like looking at this uh, precious stone, this precious metal. There's a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Uh, the Bible says in verse 4, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white rain and they had on their heads crowns of gold and out of the throne, notice this I, I just want you to notice the description of this throne out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, now, I'm not really sure what that means, but it must have been a pretty amazing view to see this throne and from the throne is proceeding lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God and before the throne, notice this there was a sea of glass 
cross. Again, what that looks like, I'm not sure. We'll have to wait till we get to heaven. But there's this sea of glass that was before the throne like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Here John describes for us that there are these four beasts, these four animals. They're these angelic beings. They're not like anything we have on the earth. He tries to describe it for us. He tells us that there's these four beasts. Uh, notice there in verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. But notice verse 8, and the, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. And I want you to notice the emphasis that we see in this passage. And it's emphasized here in verse 8 uh, is really what the entire passage is about. Because like I said, this chapter is really just a transitional chapter giving us a description of God. And if you haven't noticed, the whole point and purpose of this chapter is to give us a high view of God. When you see God and the throne room in heaven and uh, His majesty described, whenever it's described in the Bible, the purpose purpose is to give us a high view of God. We see Him with power and might and majesty. We see Him on this throne with lightning and thundering proceeding. We see the sea of glass. We see these four beasts uh, uh, that are, are, are full of eyes within and they have six wings and, and, and the Bible tells us there in verse 8 it says and the four beasts had each of them six wings about Him and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying. Now if you're a man here tonight I'd like you to read the rest of this verse. Verse 8 with me. Let's read it together. This is what they're saying in heaven. They say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty which was and is and is to come. Now now let's read it like you're a Baptist, alright? Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty which was and is and is to come. I want you to understand that in the throne room in heaven, John describes for us that there are these beasts that are surrounding the throne of God and their full job, their entire job is simply to give praise to God as they, uh, as they lift up their voice and they say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And I want you to notice that whenever you get a description of God in the Bible, it's always a high view of God. It's always an exceptional view of God. It's a majestic view of God. It's a, it's a view of God's glory. Revelation chapter 4 is not the only place we get this in Scripture. If you would, go with me to the book of Isaiah. Keep your place there in Revelation. We're going to come back to it. Go to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. If you open your Bible just right in the center, you'll more than likely fall in the book of Psalms. Right after Psalm, you have the book of uh, Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes, then Song of Solomon. And then Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number 6, Isaiah chapter number 6, and I'd like you to notice verse number 1, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, we have again a prophet of God giving us a description of the throne room of God. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. In the year that King Uzziah died. Now it's interesting to me that Isaiah takes the time to give us that time frame or that time marker. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. It's interesting to me because Uzziah was a good king. And and when Uzziah had died, you may think that this might have been a troublesome time for the nation of Israel. It might have been a troublesome time for the prophet Isaiah. They might have wondered uh, and been worried about the next king that was to take the place, the next leader that was supposed to come, and how he would be, and how he would treat them, and how he would treat the people of God, and the work of God, and the men of God. But here the Bible tells us, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. Let me tell you something. It does not matter who the political leadership is in any nation because whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden, whether it's Bush or whether it's Obama, God is always on his throne. 
And here, Isaiah is reminding his people about that. He says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. And I want you to notice, I want you to notice the description. High and lifted up and his train filled the temple. I want you to notice that whenever you see a description of God, the throne room of God, the power of God, it's always a high view of God. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Notice verse 2, above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings, with twain, he tells us, he covered his face, and with twain, he covered his feet, and with twain, he did fly. Notice the consistency with Revelation 4, and one cried unto another and said, let's read it together, men, let's read it, uh, what it says there in verse 3, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The, the whole earth is full of His glory. I want you to notice that when Isaiah gives us an image of the throne of God, it is high, it is holy, and it is lifted up. When John gives us a description of God, it's high, and it's holy, and it's lifted up. Notice there in verse 4, Isaiah goes on to say, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. When they said these words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They said it in such a way that the door posts, the, the, the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. It's a high view of God. We get a high view of God in Revelation. We get a high view of God in Isaiah. But this is not the only place. Let me give you another example. Go with me to the book of Ezekiel, if you would. Ezekiel chapter 1. You're there in Isaiah. Just go past Jeremiah, into Lamentations, and into Ezekiel. Past Jeremiah, past Lamentations, into Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. In Ezekiel chapter 1, we have, yet again, another prophet giving us a description of their view of God. Notice in Ezekiel chapter 1, it, I don't have time to go through the, 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 the whole chapter, of course, of Ezekiel, but if you're familiar with Ezekiel chapter 1, Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel has the hand of God come upon him, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon him, he begins to see these visions, and he's seeing all these crazy things. He's seeing a tornado coming towards him, he's seeing these bees flying towards him, he's seeing all these amazing things, but he says in verse 26, and above the firmament that was over their head, the likeness of of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Isn't that what it said in Revelation 4? And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw the color of, of amber and the appearance of fire round about uh, within it. Here we're told, in, in, in Revelation we're told that lightning proceeded from the throne. Here we're told that he saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it and the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of a bow. Notice how that's consistent with Revelation. Revelation, there was a rainbow. Here we're told there's a, ro uh, there's a bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance uh, of the brightness round about. Have you ever wondered why it is that the filthiest, most perverted group in, in, in our world has chosen the rainbow to represent themselves? When the Bible tells us that it is a rainbow that is above the throne of God, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about this. Notice was the appearance of the likeness of the, notice the wording, the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. I want you to notice, and do me a favor, go with me to the book of Hebrews, if you would, Hebrews chapter 10. This is all by way of introduction. I'm going to get into the sermon here in a minute. Hebrews chapter 10, if you start at the book of Revelation and go backwards, you have Revelation, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, 1st John, 2nd, 1st Peter, James, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. I, I, I wanted to make the point to you tonight, and I hope I've made it. We could look at other passages yet, but I, I won't take the time to do that. But I want to make the point that whenever God is described in the Bible, whenever we get a view of God, and of course we know that 
no man has seen God at any time. We understand that. But whenever a glimpse of God, a glimpse of the power of God, the glory of God is given to us in Scripture, it's always a high view of God. He is high, He is holy, He is lifted up. It's a high view of God. And, I, I, and I'm here to tell you something. Today, we have a church culture in America today that has a very low view of God. I mean, if you want to wonder why, if you wonder why there are so many churches in our country today that want the atmosphere of their church service to feel like a casino or a, or a, a nightclub or a rock concert, the answer is really this, is because they have a low view of God. That's, right. That's, right. That's why preachers stand up and they preach uh, uh, wearing skinny jeans and sandals on a bar stool. Why? Because they have a, a, a low view of God. That's why they, they, they uh, don't take time to preach the Word of God. They don't take time to preach the actual Word of God, the King James Bible. They don't take the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God and the following of the Word of God seriously because they have a low view of God. Oftentimes, and maybe you're newer to one of our types of churches, when people come to a church like, like, like ours, Verity Baptist Church, and I'm sure Stronghold and the other churches here are similar, Sometimes we have new converts and they'll come to church and they want to know, why, why do we sing the old hymns? To them, they wonder, why do you read out of this old King James Bible? Why, why does the pastor, I realize we're at a camping trip and we're a little more casual, but usually you show up to church, and the pastor's wearing a suit and a tie. You say, why is that? Well, we could give you all sorts of reasons, but the, the short answer is this, because we have a high view of God. Because we just believe that if we're going to do something for God, we're going to do it with reverence. We're going to do it to match His glory, to match His power, to match His holiness. We have a high view of God. Amen. Churches today have a low view of God. But that's not really what I'm preaching about tonight. Tonight what I'm preaching about is not the low view of God that the church culture has, but it's the low view of God that the Christian culture has. Because I'm concerned that there are many Christians, even in our independent fundamental Baptists, even in our new IP type churches, that do not understand the concept of a high view of God. And in fact, they have a low view of God. See, here's the truth. When you have a high view of God, it'll change some things in your life. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 31. Notice what it says. This is a verse that to me highlights a high view of God. Hebrews 10, 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. I mean, that's a, that's a verse to me that declares the power, the might, the strength, the fear, the reverence that we should all have for God. And it would change our lives. It would change the way we do things. It would change the way that we live if we had a high view of God. You say, why? Because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. So I'd like to speak to you for a few moments tonight on the subject of a high view of God. Developing a high view of God. You say, okay, Pastor Benz, I understand the high view of God. I understand that when God is represented in the Bible, it's always high and holy and lifted up. But how will that really change my life? How would that change uh, my Christian walk? How would that change the way that I do things? Well, I'd like to give you three different areas in which a high view of God would change in your life if you got a high view of God. If you're taking notes tonight, I encourage you to write these things down. I'm not sure if you're able to do that. But if you're able to, maybe you can jot this down. You're there in Hebrew. Hebrews chapter 10. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 12 and let me say this. A high view of God in the Christian life, a high view of God produces proper standards. Amen. I'm talking about personal standards in your life and in my life will be produced. They are produced out of a high view of God. In fact, oftentimes when you've got young people, you've got, uh, we were talking about this last night with the pastors, uh, uh, we were having conversation about the next generation and making sure that the kids that grow up, good night. 
the kids that grow up in these types of churches that that they that they stay with it they stick with it that they stick with the standards you know one thing that I believe is that we've got to make sure that they get a high view of God because a high view of God will produce a uh, standard see when you get a high view of God you will be concerned with what is acceptable to God right. Hebrews 12 look at verse 28 notice what it says Hebrews 12 28 wherefore Hebrews 10 28 wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby notice these words we may serve God notice it we may serve God is that what we want we may serve God. Isn't that what we want in our churches? Christians that will serve God? We may serve God. Isn't that what we want from our young people? We may serve God. Isn't that what we as parents want for our children coming up and being raised uh, 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 in, in churches and in families like ours? We may serve God. But notice, the Bible says that we may serve God acceptably. Do you understand that not all service to God is acceptable to God? God is not pleased with all worship. This is why the Bible tells us that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. He's concerned with worship, but he's concerned with the mode of that worship, how that worship is conducted. He says that we may serve God acceptably, notice, with reverence and godly fear. You say, what's reverence and godly fear? It's a high view of God. Reverence is to, is, is to have respect, to be in awe of, to have fear, godly fear here in reference to us fearing God. See, when we have a high view of God, we will serve God acceptably. We will be concerned with what is acceptable to God. Notice verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Again, I just want you to notice, when, when the Bible describes God, it's an awesomeness. Our God is a consuming fire. He's not a spark. He's not a little match. You, you turn on. God is a fire that wants to consume you. God is a fire that wants to take over your life. And he wants us to serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Go to Ephesians if you would. Ephesians chapter 5. If you start at Matthew, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians 5. Let me give you another, another verse here to prove the point. See, when you get a high view of God, you will be concerned. You will become concerned with. You will become concerned with what is acceptable to God. Ephesians 5 and verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving what is acceptable, figuring out, testing, trying, and trying to understand what is acceptable unto the Lord. See, when you get a high view of God, it'll produce proper standards. Why? Because you will become concerned with what is acceptable unto the Lord. You say, Pastor Jimenez, I, I don't understand. What do you mean? Go to Genesis, if you would. Genesis 39, first book in the New Testament, Genesis 39. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you get a high view of God... When you get a high view of God, we will not have to give you a bunch of lists about what you should do or what you should not do in the Christian life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't mind lists. I'm all about lists. I love lists. I, I've got a whole conference that, that highlights lists, all right? So I'm not against lists. If you need a list, see me after the service, and I'll give you a list for whatever you need. You need a list for what you shouldn't be watching? We got one. You need a list for what websites you shouldn't be going on? We've got one. You need a list for what music you shouldn't be listening to? We've got one. You need a list. Look, whatever list you got, I'm not against it. Good night. I'm going to get a high view of myself. If you need a list, I'm not against lists. Don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm all for preaching lists. But I do want you to understand something. If you got a high view of God and you became concerned with what is acceptable to God, you wouldn't need so many lists. And they wouldn't have to be so long. I mean, Pastor Shelley, God bless him. I love his preaching and I'm glad he's doing this. But if you had a high view of God, he wouldn't have to preach a sermon explaining to you what's wrong with the Truman Show. 
Yeah. If you got a high view of God, he wouldn't have to make, pre preach a sermon explain to you what's wrong with the minority report. If you got a high view of God, hey, if you got a high view of God, we wouldn't have to preach sermons against Star Wars. We wouldn't have to preach sermons against The Matrix. We wouldn't have to preach sermons against Spider Man and Superman and Batman. Hey, if you got a high view of God, we wouldn't have to sit here and explain to you what's wrong with Disney and all their pedophilia and all their faggotry and all they're trying to uh, uh, brainwash our children. Hey, if you got a high view of God, you would all of a sudden become concerned with what is acceptable to God. Right. And when you become concerned with, is this something that is acceptable to the Lord? All of a sudden, the list become irrelevant. Because people always want to fight the list. You teach standards, and I'm all for standards. But what, you, 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 get, you get these young ladies, and they want to know, well, how low is too low on a shirt? And how high is too high on a skirt? And how tight is too tight? And how short can my short be? My, my hair be? Before I'm a transvestite, right? And then you got, and then you got these guys, well, how skinny are skinny jeans? And, 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 and look, if you gotta ask the question, they're too skinny. By the way, let me leave you in on a, little, on a little secret. Skinny jeans don't make you look skinny unless you're actually skinny. Just, you should probably know that. And, well, how long can my hair? Because, you know, the style is to have shaggy hair. So how long can it be before, it's, uh, uh, before I cross the line, before I st uh, step over the rules? They want, they, you know, they want you to give them all these examples. I don't know if these pastors, I'm sure they're the same way we are, but we get emails every week, and people want, they ask these questions, and they want us to just give them these specific, you know, here's what you have to do, and here's the closest you can get to the world. Here's the closest you can get to sin. This is as far as you can go and I'm just here to tell you something if you got a high view of God and you were concerned with what was acceptable to God you would need a list Amen. Amen. if young ladies woke up every day if ladies woke up every day and looked in the mirror and looked at what they were wearing and they asked themselves is this acceptable to God yeah. you wouldn't have the emulous when you turn on the radio and you start listening to music, if you ask yourself this question, is this acceptable to God? Is this pleasing to God? Is this something God wants me to listen to? Hey, you wouldn't need a list. When you, when you start watching a show or start watching a movie and ask yourself, is this what's pleasing to the Lord? Does this bring pleasure to God? You wouldn't need a list. Go back to Revelation chapter 4 if you would. Revelation chapter 4. There have been times in my ministry when people, and God bless them, their heart's in the right place. I don't think anybody does this from a bad heart. Sometimes people, they'll, they'll, give, they'll give us a, a gift card to a restaurant, and they're trying to be a blessing to us. There's been times when my wife and I, you know, maybe we're going on a, a, a date night or something, and, oh, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so gave us a gift card to this restaurant. Some, sometimes the restaurant we've never been to, never, 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 never been there. We we'll say, well, let's go, let's go try it. You know, they, they gave us this gift card, and there have been times when, uh, you know, my wife and I, we, we walk into a restaurant, we take one step into the restaurant, we kind of look around, we look at each other, and we're like, let's go. And you say, well, there's just something about living your life with a high view of God that makes you think, I don't think this is acceptable to the Lord. And, 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 and you give that illustration, people say, well what, well, what is it? What do you, you know, what, what, what restaurant is it? Tell me what the restaurant is so I won't go there. But I can't give you a list of every restaurant. I'm just, I'm just telling you, sometimes you walk into a restaurant and the lights are dark and the music's loud and the waitresses are dancing and you think to yourself, this is not acceptable to God. This is not what God wants. This is not where God wants me. This is not something that is pleasing to the Lord. I'm just here to tell you something. I'm just here to tell you something. Sometimes, sometimes, it's not a list. It's just asking yourself this question, is this pleasing to God? Years ago, my wife and I had been married for a couple of years. We were out to dinner with a couple, an older couple, and they were a nice couple, and I really liked them, and they were 
being a blessing to us. And I remember he, lo he looked at me. I was maybe 18 years old at the time. And he looked at me and he said, do you know what your purpose in life as a Christian is? And I said, yeah, I, I think so. And he said, what's your purpose in life? And I began to do what every, you know, good independent fundamental Baptist does. I began to rattle off a list. Well, to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and, and to go soul winning, and to read the Bible, and to pray, and to tithe, and, and to do this, and to do that. And, and, I, and I'm not against any of that. I'm, by the way, I'm still for all of that. But I remember he opened up his Bible, and he took me to this verse. Revelation chapter 4. And, and, and I want you to understand the context. As we read the entire chapter in its context, and we saw that the entire chapter is all about the glory of God. It's all about the fact that God is high, holy, lifted up. And the very last verse, verse 11, gives us the application. Revelation 4.11, the Bible says, because God is high, because God is holy, because God is lifted up, the Bible says, thou are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Do you all know why God created you? Do you all know why God created me? For His pleasure. Now I believe that going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night brings pleasure to God. I believe that going soul winning brings pleasure to God. I believe that going being a tither brings pleasure to God. I believe that reading your Bible every day and praying every day brings pleasure to God. But I'm just here to tell you, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that when you understand that God is high, holy, lifted up. And my job and my purpose is to bring pleasure to Him, is to serve Him in an acceptable passion, an acceptable way. It'll produce proper standards. You'll stop asking the wrong questions and you'll start asking the right questions. You say, what's the wrong question? Here's the wrong question. Young people, listen up. Here's the wrong question. Your mom, your dad, they tell you, don't go there, don't do that, don't talk to that person. Don't watch that, don't listen to that. Here's the wrong question. What's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it? Why can't I go there? Why can't I listen to that? Why can't... Look... When you get a high view of God, you'll stop asking what's wrong with it, and you'll start asking what's right with it. You'll, you'll stop asking, what can I get away with? You'll stop asking, what's the closest I can get to the line without crossing it? And you'll start asking, what would be pleasing to my Heavenly Father? See, the truth is this, in the Christian life, you and I should not be choosing between the good and the bad. Oh no, we should not be choosing between the good and the bad. We should be choosing between the good and the best. What's the best thing I could do with my life? What's the best thing I could do today? What's the best thing? If you're asking yourself on a Sunday night and you're wondering, should I go to church or not? You should ask yourself this question, what would be pleasing to the Lord? What would be acceptable to Him? What would be the wisest thing? What would be the best thing for me to do with my life right now? See, I'm, I'm here to tell you something. I'm here to tell you that a high view of God produces standards. When you get a high view of God, you begin to care about and concern yourself with, not lists, and I'm not against lists, but you begin to concern yourself with what is acceptable to God. And I, I just believe, I just believe, that if I could help you, if I could help all these young people develop a high view for God, then I won't have to worry about when I'm not there. I'm talking about as a father, my wife as a mother, you as parents. Hey, as a pastor, I won't have to worry about, well, what are they going to do uh, when they're uh, 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 over there in that situation? Or what are they going to do when this temptation comes? Hey, if you got a high view of God, you'll just do what is pleasing to God. In Genesis 39, we have an example of a young man who got ripped away from his family. But something about this young man, Joseph, is that he had a high view of God. And I want you to notice that when you uh, get a high view of God, not only will it uh, cause you to be concerned with what's acceptable to God, it'll also cause you to not want to sin against God. Genesis 39 and verse 7, notice what the Bible says, And it came to pass after these things 
Now we don't have time to go through the whole story of Joseph, but if you remember Joseph, he was uh, his brothers sold him into slavery. He's in Potiphar's house. And the Bible says, After these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wadeth not. That term wadeth not means knoweth not what is with me in the house. He hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house uh, than I, and neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. This is Joseph speaking to Potiphar's wife. He says, Because thou art his wife. Now I want you to notice the last little phrase of this, uh, of this verse, because this phrase reveals a lot. It reveals a lot about Joseph. He says, you got this woman asking him and tempting him to commit adultery with her. And he's responding to her and he's giving her the reasons why he can't do it. And notice he says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? Is that what he says? It would have been a sin against Potiphar. He says, how then could I do this great wickedness and sin against my parents who taught me to not do such things? Is that what he says? It would have been a sin against his parents. He says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, Joseph had a high view of God. Now, I'm sure he was concerned with Potiphar. I'm sure he was concerned with his testimony. I'm sure he was concerned with what others might think. But his primary concern was with what God thought of him. He had a high view of God. I'm just here to tell you that a high view of God produces proper standards. It'll make you be concerned with what's acceptable to God. It'll make you be concerned with uh, uh, what's not acceptable to God. It'll make you not want to sin against God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I said number one tonight, a high view of God produces proper standards. But let me give you another thought. Not only does a high view of God produce proper standards, a high view of God produces a proper view of submission. Now, when you get a high view of God, you will understand something. And it is this, that there is a chain of command in the world. There's a chain of command in life. And that chain of command ends with God at the top. Because God is high, holy, and lifted up. There's a chain of command that ends with and leads us to God. Let me give you an example of that. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Notice what Paul says. He says, but I would have you to know that the head, the word head in the Bible in reference to uh, families or government or churches is always a reference to authority. The head is the one in charge. Notice here, we're told, but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Notice, men, notice something. Because we as Baptists, we like, to, we like to highlight the fact that we're the head of the wife. The Bible says that. We're going to see that. But before we get to the husband is the head of the wife, the Bible says that Christ is the head of the man. So you've got to submit yourself also to Christ. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ, notice this, the head of Christ is God. Now, women today, the feminist women, when they hear preaching like what I'm talking about right now, they like to say, oh, you're just some sort of a male chauvinist. You want to put women down when you tell them that they've got to submit to their husband and that's putting us in a lower state and that's uh, talking about our value and if we have to submit, then you're saying that you're better than us. But wait a minute. The Bible says that Christ, God the Son, submitted himself to God the Father. Does that really... Does does that reduce the value of Christ? No, it does not. We believe in the Trinity. I mean, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The whole purpose of the Trinity is that we believe that they are co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. They are all uh, equally God. 
That God exists in three persons. Hey, Jesus is no less God than the Father is. The Holy Spirit is no less God than the Son is. But yet they choose to willingly submit themselves under the authority and it doesn't make them any less. And women are no less when they submit themselves to their husbands. And church members are no less when they submit themselves to their pastor. And, and, and employees are no less when they submit themselves to their boss. See, a high view of God will help you understand that in life, there's a chain of command. And that chain ends with God at the top because we have a high view of God. Go to Ephesians if you would. Ephesians chapter 5. You're there in 1 Corinthians. Go back to Ephesians. I'm not sure if you kept your place there. I, I meant to ask you to keep your place there, but you can go back there past uh, 1, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. When I was, I was in the military many years ago, I was in the Air Force, and, and by the way, I always like to give this disclaimer when I use the military as an, exa as an illustration. I am not, I'm not, con I'm not advising anybody go in the military ever, okay? It's just something I did, but that doesn't make it right. But when I was in the military, when I was in, in the Air Force, when we were in boot camp, one of the things that they had us do is they had us memorize our chain of command. And when I say they had us memorize the chain of command, they, they did not just have us memorize the ranks of our chain of command. They literally had us memorize the names of everyone in our chain of command. So, for example, I was an airman in boot camp, and above me was another airman that had been given the position of flight leader or flight commander. So in my chain of command, I had this other airman that was also in boot camp, but he'd been chosen to be the flight commander. He was in my chain of command. So when I was asked to rattle off the chain of command, I had to start with, with him because he was the flight commander. Then we had our staff sergeant who was in charge of our flight. Then we had a sergeant over him, a, a technical sergeant uh, uh, that was in charge of uh, our little division. And then there was a, a, a master sergeant that was in charge charge of, uh, of, of, of that entire uh, section and, and it went on and on and we went through you know up through the base commander all the way up to the Secretary of Defense which at that time was Donald Rumsfeld for us and then all the way up to the President of the United States which at that time was George Bush and we were we were asked to memorize this chain of command and the purpose of the exercise was this to explain to us that in a chain of command the authority does not come from the person above you the authority comes from the top and trickles down so when you've got a staff sergeant that gives you an order when you even have a flight commander that gives you an order and you choose to disobey that order it is a serious thing because they have been empowered they have been commissioned they have been given the authority to give those orders to take that head to be that leadership from the leadership above them from the leadership above them from the leadership above them and it went all the way up for us in the United States military up to the highest position of leadership the president of the United States and they wanted us to understand when a flight commander or a staff sergeant or a tech sergeant or a master sergeant tells you to grab a mop and to uh, go uh, clean the latrines, you should see that as an order from the president himself. Because the president himself is the one that had put the secretary of defense in his place, who had put the different generals in their places over the different uh, 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 branches of the military who had put this uh, chain of command in place all the way down to us. See, when you get a high view of God, you will understand that submission is ultimately to God. Now, what's interesting to me is that when you read the passages about submission in the Bible, this is highlighted over and over again. Let's look at it. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now, the average feminist Christian stops reading right there because they're so upset. 
I can't believe that he would turn to that passage. I can't believe that you'd read that on Mother's Day. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. But I want you to notice this. I want you to notice. Notice this phrase. Don't miss it. As unto the Lord. See, when you get a high view of God, you realize that there's a chain of command that leads to God, that ends with God, and you realize that submission at the lowest level is ultimately submission to the highest level, which is God. And it's not just wives. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 5. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. <coughs> Ephesians 6, 5, here we're told servants. Just to help you apply that in our modern society, you can think when you read servants there, think worker, employee. Servants, be obedient. What does that mean? It means to put yourself under the authority of, under, be in submission to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Again, the word master there, just think boss employer the guy in charge servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh notice notice how are you supposed to hey men you know we, we like the preaching about wives submitting and I'm all for it but hey when you go to work you're supposed to submit to your boss with fear and trembling Right. Yeah, right. Is that fear and trembling? Yeah, because you got a high view. A high view of my boss, not necessarily your boss, with fear and trembling and signals of heart. Notice, as unto Christ. Yeah. When you go to work, you got to work hard like if the Lord Jesus Christ is ordering you to do it. Amen. Like if the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that gave you that task, that assignment, that job. Why? Because you've been given a chain of command. You've been given human authority. And that chain of command, leads to God if you have a high view of God you will understand that all submission is ultimately to God notice verse 6 not with eye service as men pleasers we've all known that type of worker right the guy that only works when the boss is watching not with eye service as men pleasers but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service don't miss it as to the Lord and not to men see in a chain of command authority comes from the top and it trickles down you're there in Ephesians go to Colossians Colossians chapter 3 Ephesians Philippians Colossians over the years at my church and as I've traveled the country and the Lord has allowed me to travel and preach in different places I've been asked a, 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 a question multiple times by young men young men are the ones that like to ask me this question and they'll ask me you know they'll, they'll usually they don't really ask a question as much as they make a statement and they'll say, hi, hi Pastor Jimenez, you know, um, I'm dating this girl and I'm kind of serious about maybe uh, uh, wanting to marry her, but uh, she won't submit to me. And my response is usually, praise the Lord. And they're like, praise the Lord? I thought every woman was supposed to submit to every man. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the Bible goes out of its way to say that every wife needs to submit to her own husband. Every wife doesn't have to submit to every husband. She needs to submit to her own husband. You say, why is that important? Because your wife doesn't need to be submitting to somebody else's husband at work. She needs to be home submitting to her own husband. So get this idea out of your head that all women are supposed to submit to all men. Hey, walk up to my wife and start trying to order her around. See how that goes. <laughs> You'll get punched in the face. <laughs> because not every woman needs to submit to every man. But wives should submit to their own. So these young men, they're like, my girlfriend won't submit to me. Well, she shouldn't. Right. Till you put a ring on her finger. Yeah. Till, you, till you vow to provide and protect and position yourself as a leader in her life. She doesn't need to listen to you. She doesn't need to be submit to you. So then the inevitable question comes, well then how will I know if she's submissive? How will I know if she's submissive? And look, that's a valid question. Before I marry her, how will I know if she's submissive? And the answer is a very simple answer. It's the only answer. And it's this. 
watch her with her father. Because until she gets married, her father is the only biblical authority that she must submit herself under. So if you want to know if she's submissive, look at the person that she's currently under the head of and how she submits to him. And that will give you an idea of how she'll submit to you. And then, the, and then, and then the, you know, I've had this conversation so many times that I can't, I can't even tell you. It, it's almost, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny. Because then the answer is, well, you don't understand, her, her father's not saved. Or, or her, her dad, you know, he's, he's a Sunday morning only. Or you don't, you know, the thing about her dad is that he drinks. And, or you don't understand, her dad, he's not a very good leader. He's not very spiritual. He's not very this. He's not very that. And listen to me. I feel bad about that. I wish that all dads did not drink. I wish that all dads did not smoke. I wish that all dads read the Bible with their, uh, uh, with their families and, and read the Bible for themselves. I wish that all dads were faithful to church and soul winners. I wish that all dads were all of that. But please, help me. let, let me help you understand something. When a follower in any situation... Right now we're using the example of a young lady with her father. But it could be a young man with her father. It could be a church member with their pastor. It could be an employee with their employer. It could be a wife with her husband. It could be any, in any situation where there's biblical God-given authority. The one who is to submit if they wanted to find a reason to justify their rebellion and their lack of submission, they could do it. For everyone and for anyone. Because I like to remind these young men, oh, oh, okay, so your girlfriend doesn't submit to her father because her father's a sinner, but you're not? But you must be the Lord Jesus Christ then. Because when she gets married to you, if she wants to find some area that you're lacking in to justify her unwillingness to submit, let me let you know a little secret. She's going to find it, and she's going to find it pretty fast. Because you're a sinner. And here's the point that I'm making. When you get a high view of God... You understand that submitting and the submitting process is not hinged upon the human authority that happens to be upon you because the human authority is always going to be a sinner, is always going to be flawed, it's never going to be perfect. It doesn't matter how godly they are, it doesn't matter how good they are, it doesn't matter how great of a Christian they are, they're going to lack in something. But our submission in, in, in the human authority realm is always not a response to their character, but in reverence to God. Amen. Say, why should, well, my, bo my boss is an idiot. This is what, how men like to talk. My boss is an idiot. So I just do it the way I think it should be done because he doesn't know what to do. And then you wonder why your wife won't submit to you. Yeah. And then you wonder why your kids don't respect you. Yeah. Hey, let me let you know a secret. You reap what you sow. That's good, yeah. Yeah. You sit there and talk crap about the pastor and his sermon every Sunday on your way home from church. Oh, the pastor said this, the pastor said that. And your kids and your wife watch you rebel against your God-given authority, the pastor of the church, who the Bible says you're supposed to obey, that he is the ruler of the church. And of course, we know that we're not going to lord over God's heritage. We understand that we're not going to uh, uh, insert ourselves into matters that don't apply to us. But when it comes to the church, hey, when it comes to the church, the pastor's the boss. And then you sit there and rebel against them, and then you wonder why your kids rebel against you. Yeah. And then you wonder why your wife doesn't respect you. Yeah. You come home and complain about your boss, complain about your boss. And then you wonder why your wife complains about her boss. I'm just here to tell you something. If you have a high view of God, you will understand that submitting to flawed human authority is done in reverence to God. Colossians 3, are you there? Look at verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, and whatsoever ye do, and whatsoever ye do, I, I'm reading that over and over to highlight something. This applies to everything. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Why? Here's why. As to the Lord and not to men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Amen. See, I'm just, I'm just here to tell you something, and it's this. 
A high view of God will produce proper standards. You'll become concerned about what is acceptable to God. You'll become concerned about what is pleasing to the Lord. And you'll begin to live your life in accordance. And you won't need someone to stand up and tell you all the rules. Now, you'll like those sermons because you're a living, living your, with a life of standards. But you won't need it. Because the reason that you don't smoke and you don't chew and you don't go with the girls that do is not because the pastor said it or your dad said it, but it's because it's pleasing to God. Now you submit yourself to your pastor, you submit yourself to your uh, father, you submit yourself to your husband, you submit yourself to your boss in reverence, not to them necessarily, but to God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Who gave you that husband? Who gave you that father? Who gave you that boss? Who gave you that pastor? And the authority trickles from God down. Ladies, please understand this. When you badmouth your husband and you rebel against him and you, you're not reverent to him and you don't submit to him, you're not disrespecting your husband, you're disrespecting God. That's right. You're not rebelling against your husband. You say, well, if you knew my husband, if you knew what my husband has done, and he's hurt me, and I realize that he may have hurt you, and I realize that your husband's not perfect, and he is a sinner, and he's probably done stupid things, but you submit to God. And God has never hurt you. And he's never lied to you. And he's never let you down. See, a high view of God understands that our submission is ultimately to God. Go to Job chapter 42, if you would. Job chapter 42. We're talking about a high view of God. I said, number one tonight, a high view of God produces proper standards. Number two tonight, a high view of God produces proper submission. Let me give you a third one tonight. We'll finish up. A high view of God produces a proper view of self. Because let's, let's be honest. Why don't you listen to the preaching? Why do you go to a church where the pastor teaches you what the Bible says to do and then you say, you don't say it out loud, but you say in your mind, your heart, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't care how many times he preaches against the Truman Show. It's my favorite show and I'm going to keep watching it. <laughs> how many times he preaches against uh, Star Wars? I, I just like Star Wars. And when they come out with episode 39 and episode 40 and episode 112, I'm just going to keep watching it. I don't care what he says. See, a high view of God produces a proper view of self. And let's just be honest with ourselves. When we choose to not do what the Bible says is because we have a very inflated view of ourselves. Now here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. Whenever you see a description of God and he's described as high and holy and lifted up, you always in that description also see the reaction of the man that got that view of God. Let me give you some examples. Job 42. Remember Job? Now remember the Bible tells us that Job, by the way, that joke about the sermon being short, that was a joke. <laughs> The thing, about, the thing about Job, remember Job, he was, he was perfect. The Bible says that he never, he never sinned with his mouth. The Bible says that he, that he never charged God foolishly. And he did none of those things. He never charged God foolishly. He never, he never said God you know, is wrong and, and, and God is sinning when he does this to me. He never did any of that. But you know, one thing that Job did do is that he, he questioned God. And he questioned God a lot. He didn't say, God's wrong for doing this, but he did say, I don't know why God's doing this. He even made statements like, if God was here, I would ask him why he's doing this, and I would force him to answer me. He makes statements where he, he, he insinuates that he wants to put God on the stand, as if like in a courtroom, and he wants to cross-examine him as a lawyer and ask him, why are you doing this, and why won't you answer me, and why won't you tell me what you're doing? So God decides to show up. And God, does, God shows up in a very similar way as with Ezekiel. He shows up in a tornado. 
And he shows up. And if you remember, and I won't go take the time to go through it, but uh, God decides, okay, Job, you got questions? I got questions too. And he gives us this whole long chapter with all these questions. Where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I set the boundaries of the ocean? Where were you when I did this and when I did that? And he gives all these questions to Job. And what God is highlighting is his own power and majesty and greatness. Amen. Now notice the response from Job. When Job gets a high view of God, Job 42 and verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Notice the high view that Job has of God. He says, I know that thou canst do everything. That's the uh, uh, omnipotence of God. And that no thought can be withholden from thee. That's the omniscience of God. Notice, notice Job's new view of self. Verse 3. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore, notice what Job says, Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Job says, God, I didn't know what I was talking about. I talked about things that were too wonderful for me, things that I did not understood, things that I knew not. Notice verse 4, Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. He says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now, notice, but now, notice what he says, but now mine eye has seen thee. He says, I, I got a view of God. I got a high view of God. I got a view of God that he was high and holy and lifted up. And he says, as a result, verse 6, Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent and dust and ashes. Remember, Job didn't sin. But after getting a view, a, a view of God, you know what he said? He said, I hate myself and I repent for everything. <laughs> everything I've done, anything I've done, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. I'm just here to tell you, in light of God's holiness, we see ourselves as sinners. It's not just Job. Go, go back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. You're there in Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Psalms, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. It's consistent. When they get a high view of God, they get a low view of themselves. When they get a high view of God, they get an accurate view of themselves. Isaiah 6, look at verse 1. Isaiah 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, remember we read that? I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temples. Notice verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of, his, of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Notice verse 5. Notice Isaiah gets a high view of God. And in verse 5, we see a proper view or a low view of self. Verse 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I'm just here to tell you something. If you don't see yourself every day as a sinner that needs to get right with God every day. Now, you don't understand, Pastor. I, I, I'm a three to thriver. And I go uh, uh, soul winning. And I tithe. And I even use my vacation time to come to a camping trip where they preach to me every night. I mean, I'm pretty right with God. <laughs> if you don't wake up every day with this realization that I am a sinner and I need God, it's because you don't have a high view of God. Because if you had a high view of God, you would say, like Paul said, by God's grace, I am what I am. No, nothing that I have can I boast of. What have I received that has not been given to me? Every good gift comes from above. It is God who gives you the power to get wealth. There's nothing you have that you can glory in. There's nothing you have that you can boast in. There's nothing you have that you can brag in. When you have a high view of God, like Isaiah, you say, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. You say like Job, I abhor myself. A high view of God always produces a low view of self. A proper view of self. It's not just Isaiah. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Look at verse 28. Ezekiel 1, 28. Ezekiel 1, 28. Remember, Ezekiel got this view of the Lord. As the appearance of, a, of the bow, 
that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He said, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He said, I got a view of God and I saw his glory. I saw his power. I saw his might. Notice his response. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And I heard a voice of one that spake. See, a high view of self, a, 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 a high view of God, will fix our problem with our high view of self. In light of God's holiness, we see our need. We see ourselves as sinners. Go to Psalm 131. We're almost done. Psalm 131. Psalm 131. I don't, I don't feel that bad preaching long when I, when I travel places because I figure I, I came all the way out here. I might as well preach to you. Amen. Psalm 131, 1. Not only does a high view of God produce a proper view of self, in the light of God's holiness we see ourselves as sinners. But let me say this. In the light of God's glory we see ourselves as small. <laughs> psalm 131 and verse 1. I, I love this little psalm. It's three verses. But it's a beautiful psalm. It's David speaking. He says, Lord, my heart is not haughty. The word haughty means arrogant, superior, or lifted up. He says, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. The word lofty means proud or exalted. He says, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. See, David was a military man. He understood this concept. And when I was in the military, sometimes you'd be told to do something. And someone, someone that outranks you would be to tell you to do something. Somebody else that outranks you would walk up and question why you're, do why are you doing that. Should you be doing that? And, and the proper answer, you know, because it's, it's this catch-22, right? If you tell them, well, Tech Sergeant so-and-so told me to do it, then, it, then it's the wrong answer. Because they're like, well, I'm a Master Sergeant. And, it, and, if, and, and then if, you, if you're like, well, you know, if you want me to do it, then you're going to be in trouble with the other guy. And because they've got a chain of command, what they want you to do. So you say, well, what's the answer? The answer is this. That, that's above my pay grade. I, you're going to have to take it up with the boss. I'm just doing what I was told. And you know, David, David, he's saying, look, I do not exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. David is the king of Israel. David is the chief executive officer. David is the commander-in-chief. And David says, there are things that are above my pay grade. And look, young ladies, when some guy is trying to get all fresh with you, well, why can't we ride in a car by ourselves? That's above my pay grade. That's not a, you're going to have to take that up with my dad. Or better yet, take it up with God. That, I, I don't exercise myself in great matters or in things too high. And then I want you to notice this. I want you to notice it. This is David speaking. Remember David? What do you know about David? He killed Goliath. He's the king of Israel. He's a powerful warrior. He personally trained the group of elite warriors called the Mighty Men. I mean, this is a tough dude. This is a bold man. And David, who's also a man after God's own heart, who also has a proper view of God, who also has a high view of God, David said, Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. Notice this. Toughest guy in the Bible. As a child that is weaned of his mother, my soul is even weaned, is as a weaned child. And then he acknowledges the one that outranks him. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever.
Amen. See, a high view of God will give us a proper view of ourselves. David wasn't full of himself. He said, my heart is not haughty, my eyes are not lofty, I do not exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. He said, in fact, I have behaved and quieted myself as a child. He said, as a winged child. He said, let Israel hope in the Lord. Here's how John said it. When they came to question John, remember John the Baptist? The Pharisees came to John. John had recently given the attention to Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And people began to follow Jesus. And the people that were following John began to follow Jesus. And the crowds that John was, 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 uh, uh, was having were now getting smaller and smaller. And the Pharisees, they show up and they're trying to discourage him. And they ask him, Hey, have you noticed that everybody's following Jesus? They used to follow you. Now they're following Jesus. And here's how John put it. He said, He must increase, but I must decrease. He said, what did John have? He had a high view of God. He said, look, you know what? It's not about me. It's about God. It's not about me. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. If he increases, if he gets the glory, then the automatic result is that I must decrease. Go to Exodus chapter 3 if you would. Exodus chapter 3. Genesis, Exodus. I'm talking to you about a high view of God. I, I, hope that you'll, I hope that you'll get this idea. Because a high view of God produces the proper standards. It produces the proper submission. It produces the proper view of self. And you say, Pastor Jimenez, what are you trying to get us to, to get tonight? What do you want us to walk away from uh, with in the sermon? Here's what I want you to get is a high view of God. Amen. A high view of God in your life. I mean, all throughout the Bible we're told this. Jesus said, Jesus said, when you pray, he said, say, say these words. He said, say, this is the attitude. He said, hallowed be thy name. Yeah. You say, what is that? It's a high view of God. Right. I don't go around saying, oh my. And using the name of God in vain. His name is hallowed. It's holy. It's set apart. When it's used, it should be used in a way that is reverent. When we speak about God, uh, 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 we should speak about God in a reverent way. Yes. He's not the man upstairs. Yeah. Give me a break. Yeah. He is God Almighty God. Amen. And if we got a high view of God, it might change the way we live our lives. It might change the way we see ourselves. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4. I just want to show you these couple of things and, and we'll finish up. Exodus 3, 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside. This is Moses. Remember Moses? He left Egypt because he killed a man. He's now been on the backside of the desert for 40 years. And the Bible says that when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. So, so get, get the story. Moses is out in the desert, backside desert, taking care of these animals. And as he's walking by, a bush starts talking to him. A bush is on fire, and the bush says, Hey, Moses. <laughs> Moses. Here am I. I mean, what do you say to a burning bush? Here am I. <laughs> then he said, Who's he? The burning bush. Then he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. People like to talk about the Holy Land. The Holy Land. You know, referring to Jerusalem and Israel. Here we have the, the Holy Land, the Holy Ground. This is actually Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, in Arabia. Yeah. Not Israel. Right. So how do you explain that? Here's how I explain that. Wherever God is, that's the holy ground. Amen. Wherever God is, that's the holy land. Wherever God is, and by the way, do you know that you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit of God, which is God? You said, what's the holy land? It's Alberta, Georgia. You say, this place is holy. It is right now. 
when God's people are here, this is the holy land. And, and, and the Bible teaches us something about how we approach, how we approach God. He says, hey, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moses there on the backside of the desert. Go to Joshua chapter 5, if you would, Joshua 5. You're there in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Joshua chapter 5. By the way, let me say this, when, when the burning bush called to Moses, what caught Moses' attention was the fact that the bush was burning and not being consumed. If you remember, we, we saw in Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. You know that God wants to consume you, but he does not want to burn you up. God wants to take over your life, but he will empower you to do so. Joshua 5 and verse 13 here we have Joshua, this is many years later. Joshua has now led the children of Israel into the promised land. He's getting ready to begin to conquer the land. The Bible says in verse 13, Joshua 5, 13, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and said unto him, Art thou for us, or for our adversaries? I love, I love this story. Because here you have Joshua, a military leader, getting ready to begin a military campaign. He's out by himself, praying and meditating and thinking. And this man shows up and he's got a sword in his hand, a weapon in his hand. And Joshua asked him the same question that you and I often like to ask God. Are you for us or are you against us? Are you going to bless me, God? Are you going to help me, God? Or are you going to hinder me, God? Or are you going to hurt me, God? He says, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And I love the answer because this is what we would call a Christophany or a Theophany. This is an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love the answer because Joshua is a leader. He doesn't mince words. He asks a very specific question. Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Are you for us or are you for against us? And this man answers, verse 14, and he said, nay. And you look at that and you say, what, what is that? He said, are you for us? The question, are you for us or against us? And he says, no. <laughs> and Joshua, you know, as a leader, right? He's probably thinking to himself like, I didn't ask you a yes or no question. You, I asked you, are you for me? Are you against me? And you answer, no. You answer, nay. But I love the answer, verse 14. And he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come. He says, you want to know if I'm for you or if I'm against you? The answer is neither. The answer is nay. The answer is no. I'm not here to be for you. I'm not here to, against you, to be against you. I'm here to take over. I'm here to take charge. I'm here to take control. And by the way, in your life, God's not here to bless you or curse you. He can do both, but He's really here to just take over. Amen. He's here to take charge of your life. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Lose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. I just wonder, I just wonder if, if every time that it was time to go to church. If you realize that the building that you're walking in, not because that building is special, but the building that you're walking in because of the people of God assembled in that building, because of the Word of God being preached in that building, because of the man of God proclaiming the truth of God's Word. If you realize that that was holy land, I mean, and I'm not telling you to do this, but if you were to, please don't do this, alright? But if you were to take your shoes off and say, the place where I'm standing is holy ground. I wonder if you stopped skipping Sunday night service because of the Emmys or the Grammys or the Oscars or whatever lame excuse you've got if you saw it as a time that was holy I, I wonder if you would start reading your Bible 
consistently. If you would begin to develop an actual time of communion and devotion with God, if every time you approached that Bible, you approached it reverently, you took your shoes off and understood that I'm uh, standing in a holy place. I'm about to speak to a holy God. I'm going to hear from a holy God. I'm going to bow my head and pray to a holy God. There's a throne in heaven with majesty and glory. And I get to access God. Amen. Wonder if you'd quit skipping your Bible reading week after week, month after month. I wonder if you understood that when you and I go out and we knock doors, the Bible says that we are co laborers with God. Amen. I mean, forget your silent partner. Praise God for your silent partner. But my silent partner is not brother so and so. My silent partner is God Himself, Amen. the Holy Spirit of God. Back when we started Verity Baptist Church, I would go soul winning by myself a lot because we didn't have a lot. Of, uh, we didn't have soul winners, men for, to go with me, so I'd go by myself and I'd knock doors and uh, people would ask. I said, "Hi, we're from Verity Baptist Church," and it was just me. <laughs> and 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 every once in a while, somebody would ask me, like, "There's more of you?" I'm like, I've got a partner. His name is God. I'm I'm just here to tell you. That if we began to see our relationship with God, our walk with God, high, holy, lifted up, special, reverently, it would change your life. We wouldn't have to preach these sermons about you going soul winning. You'd go soul winning because you saw high, because you saw God high, holy, and lifted up. Amen. We have to preach sermons about standards. You'd have standards because you saw God high, holy, and lifted up. We don't have to preach about reading the Bible and prayer and church attendance. You do those things because you saw God high, holy, and lifted up. I hope you'll see God high, holy, and lifted up. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for these passages of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for these references to the throne of God and how we can see you, how we should see you, high, holy, and lifted up. Lord, I believe it would change our standards. I believe it would change our submission. I, would, I believe it would change our view of self if we would get the proper view of God. I pray you'd help us. In the matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.